A week in which a 17-year-old was arrested for writing offensive tweets about an Olympic diver. A Greek triple jumper was sent home from the Olympics after tweeting racist comments. And an English footballer is being investigated by the Football Association for what he said on his Twitter account. We ask, should there be limits to what we tweet or post on Facebook? And if so, who decides what the limits are? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Social media has changed the way we seek information and share it. The tweet, the blog are relatively new forums in which we can say what we want, where we want and when we want. Social networks like Twitter and Facebook gives anyone anywhere a forum for their thoughts and comments. And these networks have created a new way to organize, introducing a new dynamic in political exchange. But controversy has raged over Twitter this week following the arrest of a man over an offensive tweet directed at Olympic diver Tom Daly. And in another incident, a newspaper reporter had his account temporarily suspended after angrily tweeting the email address of an NBC TV executive in protest at what he considered its inferior Olympics coverage. Publishing private information is a violation of Twitter's terms of use, but in this case, Twitter executives admitted a mistake as the email address was already available online and it reinstated the reporter's account. But while mainstream media is limited in what it publishes by libel, contempt and decency laws, social media is largely not. How or if it should be policed is a question yet to be answered. And if a clampdown were to be implemented, would it be a threat to freedom of speech, a denial of the unfettered access to information and comment envisaged by those who develop the World Wide Web? In January, the social media network Twitter introduced a new technology so it can censor messages on a country-by-country -country basis. Many critics argue this move has serious implications on the country's commitment to the freedom of speech. The accusation of some that Twitter is intent on avoiding blockage by any country so it can continue to widen its user base and make more money. Others claim attempted political influence in Twitter, pointing to the acquisition of a huge block of shares by a Saudi prince during a time of heightened social unrest in Saudi Arabia at the end of last year. So should there be limits on social media? To answer this question, we're joined by our guests. In Palo Alto, California, Scott Golder, social media and internet researcher at Cornell University. In San Francisco, Gillian York, director for international freedom of expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And in Newcastle, Stuart Hyde, chief constable of Cumbria Police and spokesperson for the Association of Chief Police Officers on e-crime prevention. Welcome to you all. Let's begin in Newcastle with Stuart Hyde. Last week, police in the UK reportedly investigated some 14,000 messages on Facebook alone. Do you think it should be a police function to control content on social media? Uh, first and foremost, that 14,000 refers to the number of references to Facebook um, in one year in uh, Cumbria Police. Um, it's not 14,000 investigations, but what it does show is that there's a lot more usage of Facebook and Twitter. It's much more common to come across it both as a, a tool, as something that people use for, for, for their normal lives, and also as an object of criminality. So, so yes, we have seen an increase in references to Facebook, in Facebook as used as evidence, used as information, and providing us with intelligence. And it's only right that in order to, to make uh, use of that, that we're able to get our officers and staff to use it, to understand it, and most importantly, to have access to it uh, during their working day. Scott Golder in uh, Palo Alto, uh, your opinion on this, the involvement of forces of law and order in a way in policing content and social media? I think what the chief said is quite correct, that what we're seeing is that people's everyday lives are being blended between the online and the offline. So in the same way that we would expect local law enforcement to be policing our streets and our neighborhoods, I think it's reasonable at some level to expect the police to be 
being involved in what is taking place in social media because of the uh, the fact that it is part of people's everyday lives and and so i don't think that's uh, at all unreasonable uh, but at some point uh we need to draw a line between what is uh the investigation of criminal behavior and what is really the observation of mundane or uh, everyday behavior. Well, we'll get to that line in, in during the course of this program. But Gillian Walk, uh, York in San Francisco, your initial opinion on the policing of social media. Sure. I mean, these are private companies, and so they can make whatever rules they like, um, but they are entitled, if they so wish, to uh, to keep those rules as closely in line with the First Amendment in the U.S. Um, as they would like to. And so uh, with that in mind, you know, I think that Twitter has taken an approach that allows for, um, you know, a larger degree of free expression than on most social media platforms. Um, and I do think that those laws, uh, you know, there should be no stricter law than exists offline. Well, Stuart Hyde, it does appear from your uh, statement there that it's almost a new technology for the police as well. Uh, you people are having to learn exactly what is happening, how social media is used and how it uh, mixes in to the social community as a whole. Yes, I think, I think there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One is that this is basically old wine in new bottles. So you can commit offences offline in exactly the same way as you can commit offences online. Uh, we have within the UK some legislation that supports us. Um, but what we must remember is that there is no anywhere in the world an absolute right to freedom of speech. Every country has some restrictions and the UK is no exception to that. Um, and the restrictions are pretty, um, pretty tough to get over. So in, in, for somebody to be uh, com convicted of an offence of, uh, for example, make, making threats or annoyance under the, data communi uh, sorry, the com Malicious Communications Act, there is quite a high threshold. And that decision about whether something is uh, prosecuted is made by the Independent Crown Prosecution Service, not just by the police. But what we try to use is, is as much as possible common sense and police discretion to make sure that we are, we are not um, putting people in front of the court who don't deserve to be there. Um, but it's quite right that we should be on the pitch. Um, Twitter and Facebook, whilst they're private companies, um, they act in a way that ha um, have become so popular that they are essentially open and public space. And that open and public space is no different to a park or a, a countryside or a hill or, or a, a city centre. It still needs policing and sometimes people get it wrong, commit offences and they need to be brought to justice. Well, Gillian York, we heard there the statement that nowhere in the world can there be an absolute freedom of speech, that there needs to be some form of control. Do you agree? I do agree. I mean, this is, um, you know, t Twitter, for example, is a U.S.-based company, and so they're bound to U.S. law. And the First Amendment in the U.S. protects most speech, but of course there are exceptions to that. For example, direct incitement to violence. Um, and so a case like that, obviously, I believe that the same laws that apply offline should apply online as well. But uh, this is not necessarily just a, a First Amendment issue, perhaps, Scott uh, Golder. We, we are talking here not just about freedom. We are also talking about responsibility, are we not? Yes, I think that's true. I think we are talking about responsibility. And one of the difficulties with social media platforms is they transcend communities, they transcend neighborhoods, they transcend countries and regions of the world. And one of the things that is going to be uh, difficult for these companies to do. And really, Twitter, Facebook, and so on are global companies. They're transnational companies operating all over the world. One of the things that's going to be difficult for them to do is to have policies that they can uh, enforce and that makes sense all across the world. They need to be sensitive to the local uh, cultures and the local norms in which they operate because things that may be uh, socially appropriate in one country or in one in one region of the world may be inappropriate in others and they need to tailor their policies to uh, what is appropriate for the for the individual contexts of those places. Now it would appear that that is precisely what Twitter is beginning to do in terms of creating specific uh, country-based regulations and rules on the usage of its service but uh, Gillian York uh, this 
bearing in mind that there are different cultures around the world, there are different things of what are acceptable and what is not. Is it possible to have a global international standard at all, or does it have to be done on a country by country, culture by culture basis? Well, it's very difficult to have a global standard. And uh, Twitter, you know, does not yet have, um, it's not yet truly a transnational company. They don't have offices in many countries the way, say, Google does. Um, and so they're not actually bound by these local laws um, in the way that a larger company is. But I do think that, yes, of course, companies have been making these decisions for a long time. And a lot of um, what they've resorted to is blocking certain content per country. And that's what Twitter has said that it will do um, at the, at a, you know, with a specific legal request. But that's not the same as creating policies that are sensitive to a local culture. That's simply abiding by the laws of a different country. And that's what Twitter has said it will do. Well, Stuart Hyde, I just wanted to, to deal with a specific issue here that we have made mention of. Uh, one of the cases that we mentioned was the uh, sending of a tweet to an Olympic diver by a 17-year-old. Now, what is interesting in this is that the recipient, in fact, retweeted that particular message, which was in itself offensive, the investigation, obviously, as to its legality uh, pending. But this question of retweeting, uh, it is very difficult to get to the source and the intention of the initial message, is it not, once you have something trending, as it is said, and creating a pyramid type of uh, affair where if there is a criminal or offensive comment, then that becomes spiraling out of control. How much of an issue is this to you? Well, there's, there's two aspects of this. One is that in relation to any allegation will apply common sense and discretion and will look at how it relates to other priorities that we've got and I think that's only right. The, the second aspect of it is you're absolutely right um, you could have this pyramid it can be quite difficult sometimes to contain some of the comments but I'll come back to the original thing you cannot have a, a freedom or a right um, of free expression without having some responsibility and people going online have exactly the same responsibilities as they have offline, whether it's at a, a football match or a soccer match um, or attending a sports event or doing anything else. The same thing applies. If you transgress the law and the law of the particular country concerned, and obviously in the UK it would be things like the Mil Malicious uh, Communications Act, the Communications Act itself, um, then you can expect to be brought to justice for it. Now that is few and far between. We don't want to stop people from, from having uh, proper comment um, and there is a massive amount of flexibility. But we're not going to come down hard on somebody that has made an honest mistake or made one comment um, without looking at the context of everything else that they've said. Well, uh, Gillian York, it does seem this question of context is all important in this particular case. We are essentially looking at, well, what did you mean if you have a message saying, uh, composing a death threat, for example? Was this just frustration and a meaningless threat or was it indeed something serious? Who decides that, do you believe? I mean, that's a very difficult decision that's obviously um, up to law enforcement in that case. And I think that Twitter, you know, by, I mean, at least in the United States, Twitter's not responsible for the type of, uh, for the content that's set on the site in most cases, because we do have um, uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which protects intermediaries like Twitter um, from liability in those cases. But, so I think really what it comes down to is law enforcement ensuring that, um, you, know, you know, being able to look at, look at a threat in context and determining uh, what, you know, it really constitutes. But uh, understanding all of this too, though, and I'd like to go to Scott Gold on this, we are talking about regulation at some stage. Regulation which uh, those who developed the World Wide Web went out of their way to attempt to avoid. Is it unavoidable, do you believe? Well, this gets back to one of the points that was mentioned earlier, which is that these are private companies. And in the earlier days of the Internet, in the 1980s and even into the 1990s, much of the communication that took place on the Internet was taking place over non-commercial services. And that changed uh, from the mid-90s onward. And today, we're in a situation where much of the social interaction that's taking place is taking place in things like Twitter and Facebook, which, as was mentioned, are private companies and are not uh, subject to the same strictures as the law. And if they choose to uh limit or uh, make policies that one does not like, as a customer, one can simply take your participation elsewhere. And so we have to look at them in a very different way than we think about, uh, say, for example, governments 
uh, making uh, regulations on speech. As private companies, they can essentially do as they please, and we're free to take our socialization elsewhere. But we do run the danger uh, as a as societies, as as people, as individuals of relying too heavily on the services of private companies where we really don't have uh, any recourse uh, beyond non-participation, which I should add, as more and more people are participating, non-participation really doesn't uh, any longer exist as a choice because non-participating becomes equivalent to uh, essentially social isolation. Yes, this is a very important point because the companies would argue that if you don't like what we do or what you receive, you can simply block any sender or simply remove yourself from our services. Gillian York, though, is that enough given the what we just heard there about your option is either social alienation or participation and exposure to something you might find offensive? Right. I have to say that I, I, I sort of agree here with what he just said um, in terms of, you know, Facebook has over 900 million users at this point. And so if you are um, removed from that service and, and with Facebook, you can be for many simple offenses and um, their terms of service are rather strict and go well beyond Article 19 or the First Amendment. Um, if you're removed from that service, you're essentially um, excluded from the what we think of as the public sphere, but is actually sort of a quasi public sphere. Um, and so in that case, I think that, you know, we're, it's a very tricky territory to navigate um, and you know there are other places that you can go on the internet there are um, a lot of uh, sort of federated or, or less distributed services um, that are coming about at this point but the fact is the conversation is taking place on Facebook or on Twitter where there's 900 million or 500 million users respectively well Stuart Hyde a, a point that many have uh, looked at is comparing the internet and the social media services at this stage to the advent of the mass newspaper, particularly in, in England in the 17th and 18th centuries, where some of what was published was totally uh, outrageous. A new form of dissemination was in place, and there were very few or no controls whatsoever. Do you think this is a valid comparison, that we're looking at a technology and a means of communication that is still very much in its infancy? Yes, and I, I, th I smile because I think there's, a, there's a, a common message in this that every time there's been this sort of development in technology, uh, whether it's the telephone, the motor car, the newspaper, um, or the internet, or, or even social media, you've had law enforcement people saying this is terrible, um, you know, the world will come to an end and, and crime will go up. Um, we take a slightly different view from that. Within Cumbria, all our officers and staff have access to uh, social media at work um, so they can get the best benefits of it, there's lots of operational benefits, they can talk to their, um, uh, their communities, they can engage in, in communication and they can, can help to make Cumbria a much safer place. Um, and that also equips them that when people come in and say I, I, I've got a problem on Facebook or I, um, I've been harassed on uh, Twitter, they understand what it's about and they can do something about it. Um, so we take quite a, a progressive view as do a number of forces in the UK and in fact in, in uh, the US as well. Um, but coming back to one of the main points that was made just now, and that is that it, th these things do not operate in a vacuum. So we already have legislation to protect the things that people can say and do in a public arena. And that applies exactly online as it does offline. In exactly the same way is that we have a code of professional practice for police officers that manages their behaviour both on and off duty. All we've done is apply that online. So anything they can do to transgress offline, they can do online as well. Um, if they keep to that um, code of professional practice, um, then they can use the internet, they can use social media um, uh, to do their business. But if they go against it, then clearly they commit offences, disciplinary offences, and we can deal with them. Scott Golder, are we, are we looking here at largely an issue of self-regulation, an issue where users, companies who provide the forums, are themselves responsible for controlling the nature of the dialogue. Do you think that this is the case? Well, it depends who the self that you're talking about is. I think uh, it's no more or no less on social media the responsibility of people to uh, act in ways that they think are appropriate or or inappropriate, but I think what the uh, what the chief said momentarily ago was uh, actually quite admirable. That context is very important, and making sure that law enforcement and uh, also making sure 
that legislators and government understand uh, what is taking place uh, in social media is essential if it's going to be uh, regulated and is going to be uh, a place where law enforcement can take place. Uh, if the laws and the uh, regulations that are made are going to make sense, then it's essential that our, our law enforcement professionals are uh, understanding of, of what is taking place. So I, I think very highly of what, the, of what the chief is talking about. What, what, what we appear to be saying here is, is participation, is essential participation uh, by those who would deal with any offenses uh, committed, participation by those within social uh, communities around the world. Gillian York, this, this, this issue of participation, is this a fulfillment of the promise that the Internet was going to be for all? And for it to be truly successful as a social tool, it has to be for all. It's true. I mean, I do think that social media does need to be all. And I mean, we're not at a point yet in the world where the internet is for all. We still have countries with very, very low access rates. Um, and so social media is still um, operating, uh, you know, sort of in a privileged environment. But nonetheless, I do think that it's important that everyone does have access. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is becoming what we think of as the public sphere. We no longer go out into the town square and, and put flyers up. We now go on Facebook or on Twitter to talk about those same things. And yet we must as well have the understanding that we are talking about a, an immediate act, Stuart Hyde. We are looking at a situation where sometimes somebody is angry, is sad. Uh, the think before you tweet is obviously a very important element in terms of what goes out on social forums, is it not? Yes, it is. And, and sometimes uh, some of our staff do make the odd mistake. I've done it myself. I've, I've, I've tweeted something and then th thought, no, I've, I've got that wrong and then corrected it. Um, but I, I would recall that the first word of it is social. It is, after all, a social network. It's not a corporate network. It's not, not a legal network. So it's not designed um, to be um, precise. If you look at the spelling, if you look at the grammar, if you look at the way people talk on Twitter, it's, it's very different to a more legalistic or a, a corporate-based communications tool. It, it, it does allow people to just have a chat. And we use it together with things like um, uh, uh, so, uh, for um, chats so that we can have discussions with our local community. We use Cover It Live so that we can have an online debate. We have a, a messaging service which is run as a social network. People can access it in whatever they, way they want, whether they're using their broadband, whether they're using their smartphone, or in fact through the telephone. Um, and they can get the information they need. It's all about engaging people, letting people use it in the, uh, to the extent of the technology they're comfortable with, and then occasionally having to wrap them up in a protective legal blanket um, when they're abused online in such a way that it, it breaches the law. Well, Scott Golder, it appears that we are talking about something that benefits far outweigh any of the social disadvantages that we highlighted at the beginning of this discussion. Your view? I think that's certainly true. I think that for every case of someone saying something stupid or mean or cruel, there are cases of people who are using social media truly for free expression, people who are uh, using it to express unpopular political views, people who are using it to uh, do a wide variety of things that gives them an audience, uh, even uh, relatively lower stakes things like uh, people who want to produce a video and put it on YouTube and have a music career. Well, uh, last, at last all thought. levels of what we might call uh, importance. Well, last thought from you, Gillian yeah, York. I, I, I are are we looking at thought. something that ultimately is transforming society in a beneficial way? I think that we are. I mean, I think, you know, what we've seen over the past few years with Twitter being used as a tool of protest um, or with Facebook being used to organize in local communities, not just not just for revolution necessarily, but for, you know, local organizing, for, for small change. Um, I do think that we're looking at an ultimately positive tool. And of course, we should take responsibility for our actions on these sites and, you know, police ourselves. Um, but, you know, I do think that in, in large part, these are positive things. Well, on that notation, my thanks to our guests, Scott Golder, Gillian York, and Stuart Hyde. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.